Now, you remember the year started. Our theme for the year is looking unto Jesus. And I had a teaching on a series in tandem with the theme of the year. And then I had to travel and then we had to declare, set my heart on fire. So I had to suspend that series and came to I taught different things. I'm going back to the series again. Now, our scripture, just to remind you that our theme for this year is looking unto Jesus. He's the center of everything we do. He's the reason for the church. If you look unto any pastor, you look unto any prophet, you have missed the mark. Jesus is the focus. Jesus is the focus. You don't come to church to look at people and become judgmental of people. Oh, I know this person. I thought they were good Christians. Look at how they talk. Look at how they act. You are not here to sit in judgment of anybody. I have been born again since I was 14 years old. I have never criticized anybody's Christian lives, any pastor's sermon. I just look unto Jesus. I just look unto Jesus. If you preach and I don't find Christ in the sermon, well... I just go on to study my Christ. It's in the Bible. Okay? Now, in Hebrews 12, verse 2, from the Message Bible, keep your eyes on Jesus. Do what? Keep your eyes on Jesus. We both, who both began and finished this race, we are in. So Jesus began this race. That we are in. And he finished it. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight. Of where he was headed. That as, as he lay rating. Finished. In and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Anything along the way. Cross. Shame. Whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. You see, this scripture eh, should set the parameters for your Christian faith. How you want to live your Christian faith. Jesus must be the example. Just the example. How you want to live your Christian life. Jesus must be the example, the center. Now, I've gone on to say that for us to learn from Jesus, we want to Pick from what he himself has said that he is. So seven things that Jesus has said he is. Number one, he says, I am the bread of life, John, 3, John 6, 35. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. I am the gate for the sheep, John 10, 17. I am the good shepherd, John 8. 10, 11. I am the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five. 25. I am the way and the truth and the life, John 14, 16. I am the true vine, John, John 15, 1. Now, do you realize that anytime I come to continue this sermon, I go back to this and I repeat it. Because I want you to register in your heart. The more you repeat things and repeat things and repeat things, it registers in the heart of the people. And this seven I am of Jesus... I want you to it to register in your spirit. Now, any person, pastor, whoever that preaches a sermon, and you don't find one or two or all these servings in the sermon, that sermon is not a sound doctrine. It must point you to Jesus. In pointing you to Jesus, one of these things will come in. For almost six months. We have been studying on, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. So John 15, the scriptures that we have been using is from John 15, from verse 1 to 7. John 15, from the verse 1 to 7. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. This amount of fruitfulness. The whole Christian life is evidence-based living. Evidence-based living. You cannot be a Christian by words. 
You are a Christian by works. So you need to bear fruit. You need to bear fruit. You are a Christian by what? Works, not words. Not words. You are a Christian by works. So Jesus said, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. So keep in mind. Was every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. He prunes. So next week I'll go into this pruning thing you'll see. He prunes so that it, so that it will be even more fruitful. So that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now here. In this, 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 these few verses of scripture, you will see the word remain appearing more than any other word in this few verses of scripture. Remain in me. That's the first remain. As I also remain in you. The second remain. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do that. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Set branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burn. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. Ask whatever you wish. Ask whatever you wish. And it will be done for you. You see, the reason why we don't bear much fruit is because we don't remain in him. We don't remain in him. And you, you remember at the beginning of this series, I taught you what it means to remain in Christ. And I want to show you something. I've said to people, those people who are jealous of pastors, who are jealous of prospering Christians, get ready, they will prosper more because these people have understand these keys. You remain in him, he will remain in you, and he will bear fruit. And the key to bearing that fruit is that, ask me whatever you want. Ask me whatever you want. So you see, the Bible is a library of 66 books. And when you are doing a research in a library, you don't just take one book and write everything. You take different books and you refer to this and you, to this and you refer to this. So the Bible says that, ask and you shall receive. So now you start asking. Father, your word says, I should ask and I shall receive. I should ask. But there are other scriptures that will qualify that asking. One of them is this. If you remain in me, ask whatever you want and I will give you. So the reason why you have been asking and you are not getting is because you have not remained in him. So just before I share with you on what I'm going to share with you, all these things I'm talking about, they are all samples, they are introduction. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Look at this. So I said that any Christian that remains in Christ will bear these five fruits. You will bear the fruit of repentance. That is the quality of your recreated life. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creation. We will see it. We will see that you are a new creature. What just happened? Okay. We see that you are a new creature if you are truly born again. You can't be a Christian by birth. There must be a time 
where the Holy Ghost will convict you of sin, where you will confess, confess your sin and accept Christ Jesus. And immediately that is done, there is an automatic translation from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ. Okay? It's like you are immediately moved from darkness into light. Now, once you get into light, you now begin to see how dirty you are. And then another process called transformation begins to take place. This is where you leave your boyfriend, you leave alcohol, you leave cigarettes, you leave sexual immorality. And because if you are a new creature, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You cannot say you are a Christian and the only thing that has changed in your life is where you spend your Sunday morning. Every other thing remains. That cannot be Christianity. It will affect you how it will affect even the way you dress. It will affect the way you speak. It will affect who is your friend and who is not your friend. Jesus has said something. And it's important that this is a journey on a narrow road. Only few people travel on it. So don't be deceived by people who come to church and remain the same and think that they become your yastic. They are your yastic. I know a pastor who is cheating on his. I know a pastor who is divorced. So me too, I can divorce. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is Christ. It's Christ. It's just Christ. Am I talking to someone here? It's just Christ. So, the next one is the fruit of the Spirit, the quality of your Christian life. And I spoke to you about the fruit of the Spirit, and I even focused on just one, love. And we discussed a number of that. I haven't even finished with the love, but I'm not going back to it again. Because you should be already be loving the Lord already. With the number of weeks I spoke about the agape love. And then we went, and then did I talk about the have you spoken about the fruit of evangelism yet? Have I? But I, I've spoken about evangelism, so and then today I want to talk about the fruit of your labor. And before this month ends, I will deal with the fruit of the womb and will pray for our children and our blessed wombs of women and other things. But today, I want to talk on the fruit of your labor. And I want you to listen to this sermon carefully because many people have deliberately misquoted the scripture, deliberately misrepresented the scripture for their selfish ends. Listen. There are different ways in which you approach your Bible studies. You either approach the Bible study, your Bible study looking for things that will justify your lifestyle. Or you study the Bible looking for things that will recreate your life to make you like Christ. So now let's go. The fruit of your labor. The quality of the works of your hands. Can I preach now? Look at the scripture. Look at the scripture. Psalm 1, 2, 8, 1 to 4. From the New Living Translation. How joyful are those who fear the Lord. All who follow his ways. Those who do English. What is the essence of hyphen? Anybody? An extension of what you are saying, isn't it? So look at what look at the writer. How joyful are those who fear the Lord. And then now he wants to extend it, he wants to extend the argument. He wants to show who fears the Lord, what it means to fear the Lord. And he says, All who follow his ways. Now, now the next verse is what everybody reads. We don't read the, this previous one. Those who fear the Lord. Who? You will enjoy the fruit of your labor. How 
joyful and prosperous you will be. Look, your wife will be like a fruitful grapevine, flourishing within your home. Your children will be like vigorous young olive leaves as they sit around your table. That is the Lord's blessing for those who fear him. You know when I'm, I'm happy? I'm happy when my children and my wife, they are around me. We're having lunch. We're having a, a conversation. We are talking together. You know, I have a tradition. I call, I'm counting my children. When they are around me, we're talking. We are excited. Because when you fear the Lord and you follow his ways, you eat the fruit of your labor. But please, you have to, fearing the Lord and following his ways, Alone is not enough. You know, the, in the Bible, there was a prophet who feared the Lord. But when he died, his creditors came to take his two sons. But he feared the Lord. And you see, the Bible is very intentional about everything that it's written in it. The Bible is very intentional. There is no word in the Bible that was put in it mistakenly. So when you are reading the Bible, take every expression, every phrase, every word seriously. Now the Bible says that you will enjoy the fruit of your labor. It did not, the Bible did not say you will enjoy the fruit of God's labor, but the fruit of your labor. So immediately God introduces the aspect of work. That fearing him and following his ways alone is not enough. You need to work so that you can enjoy the fruit of your labor. In other words, if you fear God and you are lazy, there will not be a fruit for you to enjoy. Because the fear of the Lord does not buy watch. Eh? It is money that buys watch. Eh? But the fear of the Lord gives you an added advantage. Is the surety. Is the surety that if you labor, you will get fruit. You understand? So there are people who are laboring, but because they don't fear the Lord, their fruit is not coming. But if you labor and you fear God, your fruit will come. Unfortunately, I have known. Yesterday I was telling, at a, at a marriage school or so or somewhere, I was saying that I know friends I grew up with. Very prayerful, very studious of the word, very fearful of God, obedient to God. But all they did the whole day of their lives, pray, read the Bible, and sleep. Pray, read the Bible, and sleep. Whilst I prayed with them, read the Bible with them, obeyed God with them, I walked out to work. Now, this sermon, I will continue on Wednesday. Wednesday, I will talk about the consequences of laziness. And all those who are lazy will not come to work church on Wednesday. Okay. So now, let me show you something. I want to show you something. Look at this. I want to show you. There are people here who have been with me very close. They know my work ethics. Mommy and I, we don't have a problem with the only problem between me and mommy, if you see that we are quarreling, if we see mommy is angry, is because I am working too much. I'm not resting. That is my only problem with mommy. But I'm trying to rest. I'm trying, pa. But the rest, uh. the last time I told mommy, when he said, God even rested. I said, yes, after he has created the heavens and the earth. And he has accomplished everything he wanted. Let me finish creating what I want to create and I will rest. If we see people, I want to rest. I want to rest, pa. They have not done anything, though, but they want to rest, pa. I used to have a pastor friend. His wife used to work at a place so every we're all in on computer buildings on the sprinters road every morning come and see the wife to the roadside and the wife will take a car they will pass through my house and read my newspapers and then if i'm drinking tea drink some immediately after that essentially i'm going to rest a little i'm going to rest a little 
His wife divorced him for resting too much. I'm telling you. Now look at this. You see, immediately God created the heavens and the earth. And everything was in its perfect state. And he created man. He immediately introduced the concept of work. Genesis 2 verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. To work it and to take care of it. To work it and to take care of it. To work it and to take care of it. it. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? You're praying and fasting and walking around, lazying around, sitting down. Do you know what annoys me? What annoys me are people who say they are on full-time ministry and yet do nothing. From morning to evening, if you ask them what they have done with their lives, they started. As a young pastor, I decided in my mind that people in the world work eight hours a day. I'm going to focus on pursuing my ministry, anything related to my ministry, from prayer to evangelism, to witnessing to souls from serving the Lord, at least eight hours every day of my life must be devoted to my calling as a pastor. Then when I came to Sprinters Road and started this church, I said to myself that I want to get, to get out of poverty, become successful in seven years. I said, if we work eight hours a day for eight years, we become successful. But if we work 12 hours a day, for seven years, you become successful. I chose the 12 hours. And in 12 hours, in, 12, in, in seven years, I got myself out of poverty. You know what I hate? What I hate are people who are lazy. I don't hate them. I hate the laziness in them. I cannot stand the sight of a lazy person. Look at God. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. To work it and to take care of it. Now, when we go back to our initial scripture, one of the key words there is labor. So I quickly put something together. Show you how to labor, how to work. How to work for God to bless you. He blesses the works of your hands. If there are no works in your hands, he cannot bless you. He blesses the works of your hands. Ladies, that's what God does. He blesses the works of your hands. Most of you are young people here. You should be laboring so that God can bless you. When we're children, our neighbors had mango tree the mangoes were nice and beautiful we didn't plant them when the mangoes are ready we used to go and steal them we used to come and go and steal them a lot of people are like that wait for people's mangoes to be ready and they come around they want to steal and some people feel very entitled and we actually felt very entitled you know what we used to say these people are weak because when we they saw we were stealing, they went to buy dogs. So we couldn't go there again. And we, these people are wicked. They are wicked. What are they doing with their with their with their with their, with their mangoes? What are they doing with it? When human beings are hungry, they have the mangoes there. You see that we have that kind of mindset, isn't it? We feel that we feel that look at how we are suffering, and this man has money that he is not helping anybody. The last time I was telling a group of friends, I said, do you know where I live? I live in Bachuna. On my lane where I live, my house is a bit prominent. I said that if there is a coup in this country and people become lawless, my house will be one of the first houses people will attack. He said, why? I said, because in the mind of a lot of people, they think that rich people are wicked and that they have money and they are not helping anybody. But there are people in this community who I don't know having a bad who I'm assuming view me as a very wicked man. You see me driving with my car with wicked people. Wicked people. 
They have money, but they don't help anybody. Wicked people. So if there's a chaos in this country, some people will come and look for me. They will come and look for the wicked man. Behaving like when I was a child. So now when they stopped me, us from stealing the mangoes, we started insulting them. Now we stand outside and still want to steal the mangoes with a stone. And then we throw, they just said that the mango will fall. Then we look around. If the dogs are in the cage, we run and pick it. And then we feel that when we go and pick it, we conclude that we are wiser than them. You planted, we stole it. You planted, we stole it. You planted, we stole it. And some of you have that mentality. People are planting, you are stealing. People are planting, your boss has set up a company to give you some so that you can earn some small money to take care of yourself and your family. You are focusing on what your boss is earning. And so you are there throwing stones at this mango. And when the mango falls and you take it, you feel you are smarter than the man who created a job for you. So one day, one of our friends mistakenly thought the dogs were in a cage. Ran to the house, got bitten by the dog, cried a little. We ourselves covered the soil with water, asking not to tell anybody. If the dog had rabies, he would have died of rabies. Some of you people's dogs are beating you. You are dying of rabies. So let me show you. Let me show you how not to envy the owner of the mango tree who has ripe mangoes and because he planted it, he knows how to eat it. He's eating it gradually and you feel that I should have... A, if you walk through life with a sense of entitlement and you think that Bishop is my bishop. He is my daddy. If he has money, he must give me some. I have some uncle. He's a wicked uncle. Do you know every prosperous uncle in a family is a wicked uncle? And this wickedness is branded by, by the lazy boys in the family. The lazy girls in the family. Every prosperous auntie in the family is a wicked auntie. Because the lazy girls who feel that the labor of that auntie must become their fruit. Though the person is wicked. Hmm. Can I preach? Oh, I should stop. Okay, let me let me go on. So let's let me try and help you quickly, quickly and close. You see, you see what I put there? Brain. I, I really put brain there because I want to work your brain. I want to. Most of us here are very sane. A few of us are insane. And I want to bring sanity to your thinking. I want to break you away from the dependency syndrome. I want to share a few things with you. L in labor is love. Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Most young people start life with a certain career dream. Some bankers, some economists, some politicians and all those things. But usually, the first 10 years of building a career, you don't land your dream job. The first 10 years, you don't land your dream job. You end up doing something that has no relationship with what you dreamt of. So you have a lot of young people who are doing works that they don't love. Eh, I don't enjoy my work, cry. I don't enjoy my work, cry. I don't. Once you start saying those things, it affects your performance. And once it affects your performance, it becomes a habit. Even if you land your dream job, you will still lose it. So whilst you are looking for your dream job, whatever your hands finds to do, love it, enjoy it, and do it well. And do it well. You work for someone as if it was the person who didn't let you land your dream job. You understand? You were looking for your dream job. You did not get your dream job. 
somebody has offered you a job and you are bitter that the person did not offer you your dream job. Go and tell your father to create a, your dream job for you. You understand? So there are a lot of people who get them the money this work I'm going there. I don't like this. They are even the dangerous ones are those who are BSc, banking and finance. They are walking around. You are rating to over 20 banks. Nobody is replying you. Then there's a job in a restaurant. There is a job somewhere. And you feel me, if I don't get banking and finance, if I don't get banking job, I will never take any job. Walk around. When you leave university, after one year, after two years, that you have not worked, nobody wants to employ you. Why should I employ someone who has left university for two years and has not worked? Why? Why should I employ you? Because after two years, you have developed a certain habit. The habit of waking up and watching TV and eating and sleeping. Do you know if you are, if you are not working? Do you know the time you feel very sleepy? Around 10 a.m. You have eaten your breakfast and everything. Around 10 a.m., you want to sleep. You are doing like this. You want to sleep. It's also around 10 a.m. that your boss's energy is high. He has finished drinking his coffee and is looking for results and is getting results. So why am I going to hire you if you have not worked for the last two years? Why am I going to hire you to come and sleep at 10 when I'm expecting results at that time? The Lord help all of us. So, I want to tell you, love what you are doing. So, one of the young men, ladies in my church, in my office, one of the most outstanding young ladies, I've called her to my office several times. I want to keep you here. Tell me what you are looking for. I will keep you here. Had a conversation. His first degree has nothing to do with what he's doing in my office. So we had a conversation. I said, you know something? Enjoy it whilst it lasts. Have fun in this office. Work. Have fun in this office. When the opportunity for your dream job comes, I won't stop you. But have fun whilst it lasts. I think that conversation was healing for her. It opened her eyes. Have fun. Her results in the office, amazing. Her work ethics, amazing. But she's not doing her dream job. Number two, aspiration. The A, aspiration. Philippians 3, 14. I press on toward the goal for the price of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Listen. You must have a certain level of ambition and know that whatever you are doing is a journey to a destination. The fact that you don't like Mali does not mean that when your flight is going to the UK, it should not fly over Mali. So you sit down, you look at it and say, eh, we are going to pass through Mali, I won't go to the UK. What kind of thinking is that? The fact that you don't like Labadi and you are going to Osu, that don't mean you shouldn't go. Just pass through it because you have an aim. You know where you are going. Life is a journey. Sometimes you get to places you don't really like. When I go to UK where I live and where our church is, usually they will drive me past a prison. Prison area. Not inside the prison. There's a street along there. And anytime I pass there and I feel people are incarcerated there, it affects my thinking. I feel very depressed when I pass there. But I'm going to preach. My aim is preaching. That little suffering of depression before I preach should not stop me from going to preach. Do you understand? Life is a journey. Where you are today, you will not be there forever. So enjoy it whilst it lasts. Enjoy it was the last. 
a young lady approached me. Somebody is talking to me, but I don't really like the person. I don't really like the person. I want to find out whether I should talk, stop or not. I said, once you keep it platonic and you don't put your heart and everything inside, at least the midnight course, you enjoy it, don't you? He said, yes, I do. I said, continue. Just enjoy it whilst it lasts. Don't go further. Don't push further. It's only when he tells you, I love you, that you say, okay, I don't feel the same way about you. But keep the friendship. Keep talking. It doesn't kill anybody once you are not sleeping with a person and other things. You see, that is how you should approach life. Have ambition. Have ambition. But it is better, it is better to start from zero to get to ten than to say, I am waiting for three to appear. It never comes. It never comes. It never comes. What will you do if you gave birth to a child who came out of your belly, got up with teeth ready, all the 32 is there, has beard, has mustache, and say, Mommy, do you have banana? <laughs> banana. Or do you have a bono soup? Do you have ngongo? <laughs> do you have abenkwain? Do you have this thing? How will you feel? You feel, Aah! You will call me, Daddy, Daddy, please, my, my baby is talking. I would, you know what I would say? I would say, leave him at the hospital and come home. <laughs> you understand? Life, you see, begins from a point. Everything begins from somewhere. Since you decided you wanted to land your dream job, you have remained where you are. Start with something. And walk towards it. Am I talking to someone here? Now you need to believe. You need to have faith in you. You need to believe. Um, Matthew 17 verse 20. Truly I tell you, if you have faith, as small as the master seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Faith, believe. When I came to Sprinters Road here, I came with nothing, but I believed I was going to succeed. I believed it. I lived in an uncompleted building, and I believed it. One of the finest footballers, in England has produced is David Beckham. His conversion rate for, for penalties and freakies, very high. In one of his interviews, they asked him, what is the secret of the success of your freakies and penalties? He says, I always never doubt that I will miss. I always believe I will score. And when I make up my mind, I'm shooting here, I don't change it. I shoot there. The level of risk you can take for a thing is determined by the belief you have in that thing. Three things you must believe in. Believe in Christ. It is called conversion. Believe in yourself. It is called confidence. Believe in your dream. It is called conviction. When you have these three things, you can do anything. You can do anything. If you want to clap, you can clap. I mean. <laughs> Clapping is not part of listeners, so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to clap. Am I speaking to someone here? Yes. Who is this one? When did you join our audiovisual team? Oh, he is with. Am I? Oh, you came with the wedding people. Oh, I thought you were part of our audiovisual team. Okay, can I go on? Now, the next one is obedience. The next one is obedience. Deuteronomy 28 verse 1. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations. So in the pursuit of your dream, in the pursuit of whatever you are chasing, don't forget you are a Christian. Don't forget God demands from you obedience. Don't break God's law to win favor. Any Christian young woman who feels that somebody must sleep with me to get a job, you are not born again. But when you are born again, the conviction to be able to remove, ah, to think about it, to take the step, sit in the car, going to do it, even to think about it, you are rebuked already. To sit and guys start moving, Holy Ghost continues to speak to you. To start removing yourself, your nakedness, in the presence of another woman's husband. 
Ah, sister. If the Christ that lives in me is the same Christ that lives in you, you can do it. But there are young ladies sitting here right now looking at me who are sleeping with other people's husbands. And they are all right. They come to church. They are all right. Do you know that if you sleep with somebody's husband, somebody will definitely sleep with your husband when you, when you marry. You reap whatever you sow. Yeah, you reap whatever you sow. Oh, but I've asked God for forgiveness. Yes, yeah, God will forgive you the eternal consequences of your sin. You won't go to hell. But the immediate punishment of your sin, you will get it. Oh, you will get it. The Im- so don't sin at all. Because the immediate consequences of your sin, you will get it. You are sleeping with somebody's husband. And you, you want a husband? Okay, we are waiting. You will get some all right, and somebody will sleep with him. Not one. <laughs> Plenty. You see, you see, that's why when you are even going to marry, you have to be very careful. You have to check the background of people who are going to marry. So they don't bring, you don't bear their sins. Don't bear the consequences of their sins. But now, Barbara, Bob, by heart, he preach. When we preach, when we preach, you make mockery of us. Daddy, that he doesn't know. Eh? He doesn't know the way we are feeling that thing. Eh? The way we are feeling that thing. Eh? The way we are feeling that thing. Eh? Go on feeling. The way you will feel hell. Eh? Ah. <laughs> Obey the Lord. Walk in obedience. And anybody that walks in obedience to God. You also are able to obey rules and regulations. Rules and regulations set up in your office. You will. If you have not bought my book on the 50 life rules, you must buy it. Life is a game. Those who win it play by the rules. Haven't you seen people who won Olympic medals? Seven of them were decorated. When later on they found out the person had been doping, they collected all the Olympic medals from the person because he broke the rules. And the companies that have been sponsoring the person started demanding their money. They intended to make the person poor. Go back to factory setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back to factory. So all this while that we are showering money on you and all those things, you were breaking the rules. at your dope life. You, you are deceiving who? Who are you deceiving? Listen, the Bible says that the foundation of the law standeth sure. Having this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his. He knows you can't deceive God. Normal, the next one is you. Unity. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If one of them falls down, one can help the other. Can I advise you? You always need one, need one person or two people in your life to make your dream a reality. A whole pharaoh, a whole pharaoh needed Joseph. You may dream, but somebody else must interpret I have built Accra Business School because of the loyalty of a number of young people around me. Their skills, their ideas, and other things have helped me get to where I've got into. You need people. If you don't build long-lasting relationships, if you don't build strategic relationships, you will mess up your life. Look at when um, Mama Teresa lost her husband. Look at the way the whole church rallied around her. She builds good relationships. Until um, Loretta lost the mother, the church was there. Um, we lost Victor. And we were there around Portia. You, you will lose somebody. Nobody knows you. I'll come and stand here and I'm, I, when I'm announcing it, I have to call you to stand up before people or describe you. God, you are not there for people. You are not available for people. You don't stand with people. 
when people are celebrating even their birthday on the church platform, not to even say happy birthday. And then on your birthday, when nobody's commenting, you're offended. Why? How? Build relationships, invest in people, love people, care about people. You know how many people, how many fathers that they will just be there. I walk to them and say, I just came to greet you with an offering. I just came to say hi to you. You know how many fathers I call and say, oh, I see you are running this program. I, what can I do for you? Is there any leg work I can do for you? Just send me, I will go. My friends are doing things, I'm there for them. Standing. So you do know something, anytime I need assistance, I know who to call. And they will deliver immediately. You know, I, I brought some, um, uh, when we were in the other building, before we came here, I brought some uh, coolers, fans, coolers. Okay? I brought them in the church plenty. Where are they? I went to preach in a friend's church. Then we have moved here, so we, we have no need of them. I went to preach in a friend's church. The heat. The heat. And this is, uh, as I was standing there preaching, the Lord said, bring it to him. I went, came, I caught out the white. Take all these things, take it to the man. When you do these things for people, you see, do these things for people. When Joseph decided that I will leave my problems, I have been um, imprisoned wrongly, my brothers have sold me. Joseph had more problems than those his prison colleagues. But I will leave my problems to ask other people what is wrong with them. Why are they worried? When he interpreted one man's dream, it landed him in the palace. You come to a church like this, all you do is, I mean, I don't like trouble. I don't like trouble. Human beings are trouble. I don't, it is you who is the trouble. It is you who cannot keep relationship. It is you who is fighting with everybody. It is you who is quarreling with everybody. It is you who is not talking to anybody. That's why you say, I work alone. You come to a church like this, nobody knows you. We close church, you have walked away, you are gone. Even your bishop, I don't know you. Yes, close church, you pass here, you pass here, you go and sit in your car, you are gone. I don't want trouble, I'm a special human being. I'm a very special human being. Me, the church, nobody comes to my level. Which level? Where are you? If you have a high level, eh? we want to build seven floor facility here. Please build it for us. Then we know you are at a level. Then when you are coming to church, we will put 10 protocols to wait for you. All of us will die one day. And all of us, whether you are buried in Gethsemane or in your hometown village, it's still six feet. A friend of mine got ill recently in the UK. He has always been looking for a, a residency. And he went for a visit and got ill. And they admitted him. So we sought for where he had been admitted. And I called him and said, Brother, you have always been looking for resident permit. Die. <laughs> if you die, they will give you at least six feet by something land. They will bury you there. You will have permanent residence <laughs> until Christ comes. Don't destroy relationships. Don't walk away from people because you are quarried with somebody, you have disagreed on something, you have said hard things to each other. At least that shows you how the person views you so you can restructure the relationship but keep it. The person may move from close friend to a casual friend or to an acquaintance but keep the relationship. Don't let it go. You understand? Do you know how much it costs you? You see, mommy, I might do mommy for 30 years. Do you know how much it has cost me emotionally and everything? If today mommy says she's div divorcing me, I will not agree. <laughs> hey, after 30 years of investing my emotions, you are just walking away. To where? I'm, I'm not going to see again. Do you know what that means? To go and start with another woman again. And start building. So all the 30 years of emotions, they have become nothing. I'm not starting again to build new emotions. To win a woman's trust. Adjust to that new woman's personality. And all those things. 
Oh, it will not work. <laughs> Apart from the love aspect, this will be a strategic decision for me. I've invested two months for you to go. When I married you at 20, 22, you were slim. Now look at how fast you have become. <laughs> look at your bottles alone. <laughs> as, you, <laughs> as you let it go, <laughs> I married you with a small bottles. I have worked size, I become big. Now you want to take it away. When your papa. <laughs> What a church. Tom, you understand what I'm talking about? Oh dear, when, since you started dating this woman, look at the amount of emotions you have invested. Why you cold? Uh, I'm a, is everything all right? I'm fine. <laughs> oh, and I joke that one that because I'm a say I'm fine. So the boy, me boy, you know how the emotions we in Charlie, you are too smart <laughs> to, to let that thing go to waste. That's how it is. Some of you have known people from your childhood. You have known people from this thing, and then over a small thing, do you know? You see the level of my loyalty. Eh? The level of my loyalty. It's serious, so, and it's also strategic. Now Judah is busy; he's going around. So we have a new sound engineer. If a fight comes between the two of them and it's brought before me, and I have to make a choice, I will choose Judah. Because I know him longer than this new one. Don't be offended, though. So let me also know you longer. <laughs> you, you understand? I've invested too much in Judah. When Judah came to church, he used to come to church in shorts. He used to wear one earring. You haven't seen anything, no? And now look at him. I've blessed his marriage. He has now two children. Two children. I've given him a wife. Judah found um, um, Gifty in this church. He didn't bring Gifty. He came to marry my daughter. And then I've given all this investment. And then he walks away. If you know by you say <laughs> you are stuck with me. Finally, resilience. James 1, 2, and 4. Those of you who were here um, in service the last time. Resilience is consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. What you need in life is perseverance, but it must come through trials. It must come through trials. If you don't go through problems, you are nothing. You have to go through problems to be good. So you see, there are two ways in which you are you learn through formal education or through experiences. And experiences teach you better than education. I'm telling you. Hmm. To go through trials. Then the last one is I was teaching them. Most of the time, I would say, endure hardship as a good soldier. Endure hardship and do the works of ministry. Uh, Paul wrote to his own son Timothy and told him that endure hardship. Discharge the duties of your ministry. After talking about hardship that he did not solve. Like most of you born again believers, New Testament, this modern believers that everything that you go through you say is demon if you come to me you are going through crisis and i tell you son endure this you leave me and go and say that daddy doesn't have faith he doesn't care i went to my pastor with my problem he told me to go and endure it paul wrote to timothy paul who could raise the dead paul who could do major things timothy had an issue stomach ache had an ulcer he wrote to his father he said endure it endure his son and after he had told him to endure his problem, he then went further to say, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Today's pastors, if any of you has a problem, and I ignore your problem, I don't give you a call to find out, and I call you, I don't ask you, how are you? And I tell you, go and face somebody. When you put the phone down here, a friend, when me say, me who you, 
said then, Mimi Nkoye Ejuma, Mimi Nkoye Ejuma, Mimi Nkoye Ejuma. I am part of the hardship you must endure. <laughs> do, you, do you understand what I'm talking about? You must endure me. Listen, this woman has endured me. I've also endured her. Today we are enjoying life. Hardship, hardship. Sometimes I'm the hardship. I'm the one you call that you had a problem. I did not come to visit you. I'm the hardship. Endure me. I'm the one here preaching, rebuking you. Endure hardship. Learn it. It builds perseverance. My strength comes from the things I've gone through. See, my mother is 84. You see her dancing and shouting and screaming. It is my mother's emotional strength that has elongated her life. It's so tough. The things we have been through, and this woman will take us through it. We'll survive it. That her emotional strength has endured. Some of you, you will soon get what my mother has gone through. That she doesn't have her pretension. I'm surprised. The least thing you are broken down. The least thing you are crying. The least thing you are giving up. The least thing you are questioning God. He said, in the fire, I'll be with you. He's not saying, I'll stop you from going through the fire. He said, in the waters, I'll be with you. He's not saying, I'll stop you from going through the fire. Go through the fire. He will be with you. Go through the waters. You will not be drowned because he will be with you. What you need is his presence. What you need is his presence. What you need is his presence. Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil because you are with me. No man will be able to stand up against you. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. He will take you through it. He will see you through it. Thank you. I love you. Thank you for coming to church. I love you.